Yeah. Oh no, no. Now you've gone back to you. So if you, if you, uh, you can share screen again now. Yeah. Oh, the, it actually asked me about sharing audio. I need to. Yes, I guess so. No. I think it's. Sh I think it's sharing audio. Fine. So there's no problem there. Okay. Yeah. Um, Good. Cool. So uh, I think we are now live. Um, so welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Um, so yeah, I think we are now live. Ah, hold on. There's a little bit of uh, feedback there, Nikolai. I can hear my own. Um, Just a so, second. Uh, ah, okay. Do you do you have the 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 YouTube video open as well? Because there could be feedback from from this. Ah, that could be. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So that that's yeah. the most important thing. You have to make sure that you're not watching your own seminar on YouTube. Otherwise, we'll get some crazy feedback. Um. So um, okay. I'll just let you try and hunt that down. Um. So yeah, so um, in the meanwhile, I'll just, uh, just a couple of announcements. So as always, um, the format is the same. Um, so um, basically, uh, Nikolai is going to speak kind of uninterrupted for about an hour or so, uh, well, however long he wants. And then we'll have uh, moderated questions at the end of the talk. Um, so that means if you have any questions at all, um, then please feel free to just write them in the YouTube chat window and I'll relay them to Nikolai at the end of, of the talk. Um, and so I think hopefully we're now set up. Yeah, so I can see your slides now, Nikolai, so that looks good. Um, and hopefully I can hear you speaking. Mm -hmm. So uh, you <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we can hear you. That's good. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure to introduce um, Professor Nikolai Kiesel from the University of Vienna, um, who has been doing some super interesting experiments uh, on <laughs> optomechanics and in particular on kind of stochastic and quantum thermodynamics of these systems. Um, and so today he's going to be telling us about thermodynamics with levitated nanospheres. So please go ahead, Nikolai. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks, Mark, for the introduction. Um, and for asking me to participate in this in this um, nice series of talks, it's really a, a great way of of connecting and um, getting something good out of this global experience. So, um, as you said already, I, I will be talking about our experiments uh, with levitated nanospheres and towards towards thermodynamics experiments and. Um, let me dive right into it. So starting from the very beginning, uh, as you all know, the, the, the thermodynamics initially started with um, understanding engines essentially and, and how they can be improved. And at that time, we we're talking still about big systems and, uh, and essentially mean values for the exchange of heat and work also. And uh, times have changed, and today we are able to, to manipulate matter and to uh, systems at very small length scales. And uh, at small length scales, uh, Brownian motion comes into play, for example, in our bodies also, and, um, and thermal fluctuations play a role. So, in the, on that length scale, we, we um, can extend this whole framework and find a deeper understanding of the system from a perspective of thermodynamics in uh, stochastic thermodynamics. And, and um, this is kind of extending um, beyond the classical picture. For example, you see here a DNA, and there's a, a, one of the nice tools one can use on the microscale are optical tweezers. So one can stretch and compress this like a rubber band. And in contrast to a big rubber band, when you do this process, uh, stretching it and uh, getting uh, smaller again, then you will get a different work that you need to apply anytime you do that. So usually one might say, if we still get smaller, then, then we come into the quantum regime. Actually, we don't have to get smaller anymore. It's just that we can today engineer devices on the same length scale that are so well isolated from the environment that uh, 
these uh, thermal fluctuations become very small again and, and we are able to see quantum effects. And uh, the whole presentation and my research program is essentially at the interface between uh, this classical mesoscopic and the quantum world, both uh, with respect to um, the methods that are used, as well as uh, essentially covering the transition from the classical to the quantum. So let me, um, for this talk here, start uh, to introduce these methods a little bit. Optical tweezers, are known since the 70s, 70s, actually optical trapping is known since the 70s. And, uh, and this was the first work on an optical tweezer by Arthur Ashkin, um, who, who realized that if you, if you focus down a laser beam very narrow, then you directly get a 3D confinement for particles. And, um, and here it's like the laser coming from above. And then there would be particles which can be on a huge range of scales between 20 nanometer and 20 micrometer, which are trapped inside this trap, um, inside this focus of this um, tweezer. Now, another important point about this, apart from holding these particles such that we can control them, is that uh, it also gives a very sensitive detection of this particle motion um, in, in this old experiment still by observing it from the side. And this has been used in, in many different contexts um, for the biolog uh, biological applications. Arthur Ashkin cut, uh, got the Nobel Prize just in 2018. Um, but there's also like in the same year, this was kind of a pre-experiment for atom trapping. So in the same year, they trapped nat natrium atoms with this kind of tweezer. And another domain where, where it's kind of a paradigmatic system is, uh, is for stochastic thermodynamics. Now, very briefly in a nutshell, and for our purpose only um, for nanoparticles, so par Rayleigh particles that are much smaller than the wavelength, um, what, what the optical tweezer does is um, the, the light field induces a dipole in the particle and um, because of that, we uh, essentially get a optical potential that is proportional to the intensity distribution of the light field. And the intensity distribution of the light field is essentially um, almost arbitrarily shapeable. Um, the, when I say this, I relate only to the gradient force. There's also a scattering force, but no need to go into that now. And I said the other, the other important component was the readout. And the readout for such a nanoparticle happens in the interference between the light scattered off this particle, either with the tweezer light or with the independently set up um, homodyne or heterodyne detection. And uh, if the whole thing is not in such a super damped environment like a, like a water, but, but already in vacuum, then one can observe beautiful trajectories. And uh, if one brings this close to perfection, like uh, Lorenzo Magrini in, in our group uh, did with one of our tweezers, there's of course many other systems um, where, where we have an excellent reader as well, but this is just the example that, that we have in the lab. Uh, you get a resolution of 500 femtometers per square root of Hertz for the uh, detection of this motion. In other words, this means the ground state extension of such a particle, which is on the order of 100 kilohertz or so, if it's in a harmonic trap, um, can be resolved within milliseconds. And, um, and this is how it looks like, uh, fairly, uh, fairly simple. Um, the trap itself, but then of course one has to put a lot of efforts into the details. Now, when we look at um, the isolation from the environment, then one can compare these uh, levitated particles with um, other mechanical oscillators. And um, here the reference should show up in a moment. Um, so here we see all kinds of length scale uh, mechanical resonators 
um, and the quality factor, so the, the frequency of the re respective resonator over the damping rate. So how many coherent oscillations does one have? And, um, and as we can see here, smaller systems are less isolated from the environment typically, but there's kind of this uh, linear dependence. If we look at um, levitation, then even the first experiments also by Arthur Eschkin would be already in a, a, a much better isolated than these typical systems. And uh, then when all this optical levitation was revived um, about 10 years ago, we are directly go with this levitated nanoparticles far above uh, this line. Um, the first experiment running at 10 to the minus 8 millibar was uh, was in the Novotny group, and here we have extreme high quality factors. Actually, at the point where reducing the pressure doesn't really help anymore about the quality uh, about the noise in the system because recoil from photons becomes relevant. And uh, I will later talk about a system of ours, which is um, like located here at at this range of 10 to the minus six millibars right now. And this is the reason why um, initially the interest was very high to, to put this together with another field, uh, which is cavity optomechanics. Um, as, as at this time, hardly any um, oscillator had such a high mechanical quality. So here's a few words about, about uh, cavity optomechanics uh, before I tie it together. So, the standard paradigm of cavity optomechanics is that one has a cavity and motion of some oscillator will change the length of this cavity and therefore um, one gets a coupling between the light field which also exerts radiation pressure on, on this um, oscillator and the oscillator itself. This can be done in, in many different ways, either by really changing the length of this, uh, of this cavity uh, in different ways, but also by putting a dispersive element into the cavity or in photonic uh, crystal structures where the vibration would, would just uh, change the field uh, pattern. Also, there's a lot of experiment with capacitive coupling in microwaves. And um, this is a very powerful toolbox. So, so here is again uh, the resonator in a with a cavity. And uh, without going into why why it is like this, I want, just want to summarize. One can do um, on a quantum level beam splitter interactions by detuning the drive of the cavity to the red side. One can detune it to the blue side, which would give a squeezing interaction. Or one can do quantum non-demolition measurements by, by driving the cavity on, the, on resonance. And putting all of this together gives a full toolbox. Many of you have, will have seen this slide, I think, will give a full toolbox to control mechanical quantum states via the uh, light field. And the precondition to actually being able to do that is uh, that the coupling rate uh, needs to be larger, the coupling rate squared needs to be larger than the losses due to the mechanics and the losses uh, due to the loss of light from the cavity. Once this value called the cooperativity is larger than one, we can actually do quantum control here. We can uh, ground state cool. And there's a plethora of experiments right now already in the quantum regime, um, including, of course, ground state cooling, entanglement, uh, creation of non-Gaussian states, etc. cetera. Um, for the purpose of this talk, because it's, it's mostly relevant, um, uh, let me just briefly mention that a few years ago, um, multiple laser modes driving the cavity allowed to prepare squeezed states. And, uh, and this is a kind of reservoir engineering. So you switch on your lasers at, at the different tones with a different weighting, as you can see here. So this is the cavity, this is one of the drives, this is the other drive. And uh, the particle will uh, not end up as somehow thermalizing to a thermal state, but getting into a steady state that is squeezed. 
um, here you see how the how the measurement go below the ground state extension in the x quadrature. Um, and with this, I, I have everything together to um, show you why I think that the whole the whole optical levitation is a fantastic approach for for looking at thermodynamics and quantum thermodynamics. We start off with with the optical freezers, which, as I said, have been uh, used very successfully in, in stochastic thermodynamics anyway in liquid. And we can remove uh, the thermal reservoir essentially by going into vacuum, already giving a, a, a kind of a new system that that is um, uh, not over damped anymore and where the inertial term plays a significant role. I'll come back to this later. And then um, we can instead um, uh, build a kind of artificial reservoir using the methods of cavity optomechanics um, to create something uh, like quantum bars, if you want. And um, all of this together is extremely flexible because it's um, both the system and the environment are controlled optically, and therefore we have a very good control over the spatial and temporal um, char character of the system. So, for an overview of my talk, I will first give you a few examples of experiments that we are doing in the in the underdamped thermodynamics uh, with harmonic potentials, and then I go to our efforts on on working with uh, non-harmonic potentials, um, which will be for a specific instance, namely. Uh, the energetics of a classical bit operation. And finally, I want to tell you where, where we stand with respect to going into the quantum regime. So let me come back to the engine. Um, this is a classical engine, and, uh, and I, I just showed you here a Stirling cycle. And the question is, in the first place, how would we actually implement a Stirling cycle with, with such a nanoparticle? When we look at the nanoparticle in its optical trap, then, then we see uh, if, that the Langevin equation, there's Brownian force noise, uh, friction due to the gas environment, um, the potential that we would shape optically, and the inertial term that is now relevant because we're in vacuum. And... Um, when we look at a change of energy, then like in, in the way it's usually done for stochastic thermodynamics, one can split this into um, a contribution due to a control change of an external parameter, which would be work, and uh, due to a, a stochastic change, which uh, relates here because it's underdamped not only to position, but also to momentum. And uh, these are, of course, then fluctuating quantities. And um, the beautiful thing is that, that when we look at it uh, with these definitions, then we find that the ensemble averages would just follow standard thermodynamics. Um, exemplarily, if we have a harmonic trap, then, then uh, we have here just Hooke's law and um, uh, expansion or compression of our system corresponding to the piston, if you like, is uh, changing the spring constant of this harmonic trap. Um, so our Stirling cycle would um, look like this. We compress the harmonic potential, then uh, the system is heated up, then uh, one can make an ex isothermal expansion again, um, and um, Oh, down. So, so this is this is something that has been implement, implemented um, with particles in liquid, and um, and there's a full analytical model to describe this and to optimize uh, the efficiency of this process in how you drive the change of the spring constant. Um, and now we we can zoom in into a specific case. So let's just look 
add uh, this uh, mechanical expansion, then um, we know that if this is done very, very slowly, that the work that uh, is exchanged with the system uh, just corresponds to the free energy. If we do it really fast, additional entropy is produced and, and the work will be higher. And uh, previously mentioned uh, Zhazhinsky equality now gives us an equation that relates uh, the free energy um, when the state after the process equilibrates again to the to the exponential average of the work for all of these trajectories. And this is again something that many people that has been looked at in many experiments, for example, the, the stretching and com um, compression of the rubber band that I showed before, um, also in many other ways. And um, there's, of course, not only um, these purely mechanical changes of the system that can put the system out of equilibrium. <clears throat> we could also look at, at uh, thermal change. Now, um, if we uh, change the temperature of the environment uh, very slowly, the system will follow slowly, but, but we can also do that fast and the system will be out of equilibrium. And, uh, and a similar... Um, a similar fluctuation theorem holds, appears first in, in, in a paper by Shashinsky and uh, has been re-derived in very different conte contexts by Williams, Sars, Evans, and Chelly, and so on. Um, somewhat surprisingly, um, for this kind of process, there's no experiments so far. Or, well, I will show you one now. So. Um, and it goes like this. Of course, it's not easy to do a fast change of the temperature. So what, what we do in our system, we have this levitated nanoparticle inside a, a harmonic trap. In our case here, this is a hollow core photonic crystal fiber with a standing wave, but it's really not very important how we trap it. It's just a harmonic trap. We can, again, read the position of the particle and um, and uh, apply feedback. So an additional laser can be used to apply a force uh, that uh, looks like a damping, an additional damping term in the larger equation. So with this damping term on and the unchanged, um, uh, unchanged thermal noise, the system will be colder, and uh, and it looks like we we just uh, turned this temperature knob here. And by doing this, we can very rapidly change also the temperature of our system. So um, we start off with, in the most general case, with uh, a particle trapped in some harmonic trap, and then we do a compression. Here would be the piston showing like a image of what that would be in a microscopic system. We compress the system and we can, for example, at the same time change the temperature and ask whether we can uh, get for a fast process, the free energy difference using the fluctuation theory. We did two processes. One is a purely thermal change, and the other one is a change in a mechanical, a, a, a mechanical and a thermal change of the system. And this is what we get. So these are the two processes. Um, plotted is the normalized uh, free energy difference, so uh, free energy normalized to, to the temperature. Um, and uh, here you see the inverse time. So very slow processes are close to zero and fast processes are up here at, um, at the end of the plot. Now, now, very fast in our case means that um, we essentially only look at five oscillations of our harmonic oscillator which has a quality factor of several tens. Now, um, one can evaluate this by looking at a very slow system, a uh, very, very slow change, right? If you look at a very slow change, then the exchanged work will tell us everything about the change in the free energy. And um, if we evaluate the data in this way, you get this gray line up here. 
as you can see, if one does it very slow, it, we, we get the right result for the normalized free energy difference. But if we do it fast, we get a deviation because this should not depend on how fast we do the process. Taking the, taking the um, fluctuation theorem, one can see that independent of the speed of the protocol, we get the same value. And the same holds for the case of thermal and mechanical driving, which essentially is a, is a representative of the most general transformation that you can do in this uh, PV diagram. Um, the other lines here still uh, correspond to evaluation with the linear response theory, which I won't go into now. Um, so, <clears throat> As we have been talking about, about this harmonic system in the Holocaust fiber, let me quickly shed light on a, on a different aspect of essentially the, the same setup. So I, I, I just had a pro explain a protocol where we change the temperature um, using feedback cooling. Now, looking closely at what, what this means, it it's, sounds almost a bit funny because in principle, we still have one thermal reservoir there, right? Um, so why, why can we actually change the temperature of the system? And, um, and the answer lies in uh, the fact that we are retrieving information from the system and then feeding back a force, of course. Um, and one can incorporate that into the second law and this um, by, by using um, the information flow. So one way of formulating the second law would be uh, the flow of information must be larger than um, the ex uh, extracted work, time, uh, the extracted power, if you like. Now, <clears throat> another formulation of the second law would uh, use entropy pumping uh, for that. So how much entropy is pumped into or out of the system. Now, um, in, in this uh, work by Rosenberg, um, they looked at this situation for a very realistic case, namely when, um, when the feedback control uses delayed feedback. So no feedback system that you can use can do all this processing of extracting information and then applying a force instantaneously. And, and this requires this formalism. So if we look at it, it looks very much like our particle, rather than being in a fridge, if you like, is coupled to two bars. One is the thermal bars, and one is the one is the one that we artificially implement by feedback. And we have uh, two flows going on here. One is essentially extracting the entropy, and one um, uh, extracting work which is done by measuring the system and applying feedback. Um, because there's so many other things that I still want to show you, I, I don't go much deeper into this. Let me just uh, show you what we get if we do this with a time delay. So what we are measuring is position. And if we directly apply that with a delay, then, then we get uh, sometimes, heat, uh, sometimes cooling and sometimes heating of the system which is essentially this oscillation here. As you can see, the, um, the pump entropy is always larger than the extracted work. Now, if we would just ignore the fact that there's a delay, we would end up with, with this line here, um, which is called here microbial velocity feedback. If we are a bit more clever and take into account that this delay will, will introduce these oscillations, we can recover something like a Markovian form for the large Hermann equation, um, which would give us this um, black dashed boundary corresponding, corresponding essentially to our green entropy pump line. Now, now this is for short times where friction, uh, where dissipation doesn't play too much of a role yet. Uh, this is all fine. Interesting is when we have very long delays compared to the damping that the oscillator experiences. If we have very long delays, then also this Markovian description break, breaks down um, due to all the noise that goes into our system. And then our boundary, um, or Rosenberg's boundary 
for, for the entropy pumping rate still holds for the system. There's many interesting things one can still say about it, um, that the, for these long delays, um, there is noise going into the system that is actually not white anymore. And so um, there's open questions still left. Um, one of them on a fundamental side is, can we also evaluate uh, fluctuation theorems on the system? Another one is, what does the regime back here, or actually the whole description, um, look like when we go into the quantum machine? So much for the so much for the experiments that we did in, in harmonic under that system so far. And now let me go the next step towards our big experimental platform, and that is. Um, non-harmonic potentials. So this is just to show again what I stated before, optical tweezers are extremely powerful. There's not only the, the possibility to um, shape the potential, one can also have a very fast control, for example, in order to play Tetris like you can see here. Now, um, in our description from before, what changes is actually only here, this potential. And, uh, and of course, if we look at arbitrary potentials, then there's a lot of new possibilities. And um, I just, just name a few um, that can be accessed. So of course, we can go away from, from Gaussian states. Um, there's new options for force sensing that are partially also applied in, in other systems in, in real applications. Uh, one can think of squeezing that is actually more relating to the, the fast time control or, um, that is already in a harmonic system. Uh, we ha can have duffing or even non-confining uh, potentials like, like a cubic potential and um, uh, look at uh, effects like bistability or, or Kramer's turnover. This is fat because this is one, one of the things one of the few things that have been done already beyond harmonic systems in levitation. So a very beautiful work here uh, was looking at uh, double well potential and, and how in uh, for different friction of the environment, the particle would, would jump here. Um, so Kramer's turnover relates to the um, dissipation with the environment that, that makes uh, the maximum jump rate between the two wells. Um, other works uh, were using like more than one particle in levitation or looking at directly the nonlinearity in the non in the Gaussian potential, right? The, the tweezer itself is nonlinear on a, on a large scale. Um, so the, with all these possibilities of potentials that we could do, um, the question is what what should we start with? So double well looks like sufficiently unharmonic, but still not too complicated. And also it offers uh, to, to, to investigate a certain field that we got interested in, um, in particularly Mario Ciampini, um, who is a postdoc with me. And uh, we, he found that, that there's a, actually a lot of questions that will be, we will be able to answer in this. Um, if you look at this as a memory, then, then we could um, ask, for example, if our really flexible potential landscapes can simulate something that looks like a real memory. And um, also one could ask, what if I, if I do things in, in finite time um, where I have far from equilibrium behavior and can we apply that actually to real memory? So these are all questions that we are asking ourselves now and it's a, it's a starting journey. What I will uh, talk a bit later about is, is the energy cost of a memory. Um, and at this point, you probably ask yourself, well, but this is something we know. No? So, so there's Landauer's principle, and it essentially puts us a bound on um, the energy cost and the dissipation I get for a bit erasure. So Landauer stated this um, in, in his 61 paper, and, and it, it's essentially saying that we dissipate KTL in two heat if we erase a memory at this temperature T. And the reason is that we reduce the entropy of our bit if we erase the memory, and, uh, and this entropy shows up 
in the environment. Um, on a fundamental level, this is a, a very important relation between uh, entropy in the information theoretic sense and the thermodynamic sense. Um, and it's something that, that can be fulfilled, this boundary, when one is very close to the quasi-static limit. So essentially very slow. slow. In that sense, I would say it's, it's a corresponding um, statement to the Carnot efficiency, in a sense, because the Carnot efficiency also tells us what when we only look at efficiency, how fast can we get. But then for real systems, this might not be the right thing to look at because obviously we don't want to take forever to erase our memory. So the question is, what are the trade-offs between quality of the memory, speed of the processing, and, uh, and essentially entropy production in the system? For the, for the uh, case of uh, Landauer's bound, there has been a, a beautiful experiment, actually several by now, but this, this year was the first one, again with the optical tweezer. Where, where the whole idea of a bit erasure has been implemented in an optical potential in liquid. And um, one can see that if one does it, like this is the, the heat dissipated um, versus time. And if the protocol is done very slowly for this uh, liquid system on the order of several tens of seconds, one can approach uh, the Landauer bound. And there's been several other implementations here. Um, I, I want to point out one particular uh, where, where it's going beyond Landauer in some sense, because uh, when the uh, potential goes asymmetric, then suddenly it's either it's not a real bit or you make it a real bit with a 50-50 distribution, but you have to go out of equilibrium. So this makes a modification of Landauer's bound. And, and here you can see our system. So this is, um, this is how we implement a double well potential. Two lasers, uh, one is in a, in a TM00 mode, one is in a TM01 mode, and uh, this is created via SLM, which we later will use for all kinds of other potentials as well. Um, and um, then this creates here in sum this um, double well or quartic shape, if you like, or harmonic. Uh, however, we set the laser powers. And then if we add electrodes, um, <clears throat> if we add electrodes, uh, we can even tilt this, which is a part of what is necessary for the erasure protocol. These two modes, overlap um, without interference because they are both not at the same frequency and at uh, orthogonal polarizations. And this is what we get. So, so here you see uh, the, our lab screen. Here you see an image of the particle with a camera, um, which will uh, jump when I start the movie. And here you see the probability distribution. Um, and now we switched on the electrodes it's not really moving now. Ah, here. Now we, the electrodes were on. Now the particle is sometimes jumping here, but it's mainly on the left side. Electrodes off again. It's jumping between two places. Um, and now the electrodes show to the other side. So we can really, in real time, look at, at how, how this particle jumps between the wells and how we can control this. In addition, these uh, position histograms allow us to reconstruct the potential thanks to the Boltzmann distribution. And now uh, comes uh, what, what we want to do with it. So um, here again, a Landauer statement. So we have uh, the, the heat that should be larger or equal to KTL and 2. And now we ask the question, what if we prepare an out of equilibrium state initially? And this has been theoretically treated by uh, Michael Konopik and Eric Lutz, who we are working together with on this project. So then you get a new equation um, that, that puts a new bound and that involves the relative entropy of the initial state and the final state with the 
with the equilibrium state and the term for the energy for the preparation of the system. And there's new optimal protocols or let's say slightly modified optimal protocols to do this. What do we have to do in order um, to, to do an optimal erasure with this bound? Well, first of all, um, we need to prepare an out of equilibrium state. We do that by um, compressing to the, the um, double well potential. You see it here in the red line first. This uh, particle equilibrates to this new potential and we immediately switch to this wider double well, essentially lowering the bar here in the middle. And then uh, we have this out of equilibrium state for a bit, and in this, uh, and, and we start to do the erasure protocol. We lower the boundary, we tilt the whole potential, we upper the boundary again, and here you see what we need to program into our electrodes and um, uh, optical potentials. And uh, if we do this many times, we get a lot of stochastic twitch. You can see one here in black. And you can see what happens for an ensemble of trajectories um, of uh, 20,000 um, trajectories, where initially we are close to, well, we, initially we are distributed with a, a distribution of a third and two third. Um, and then, and then we look at, we perform the protocol, and after a while, we find the state with uh, 97 almost percent uh, probability only in, in one side of the double well, which corresponds to an erasure. And then we can evaluate the work and the heat for this. Sorry, this should not be equilibrium, this should be for epsilon equal four here. So this is already a protocol for a highly non-equilibrium initial state. And if we look at that for, um, for several different values of uh, how strongly we put this initial state into non-equilibrium, so here would be equilibrium, here would be far from equilibrium, then we can see that uh, the, the blue lines, uh, the blue and the orange line are the theory for a symmetric memory uh, with the equation I just showed you before, um, where about here 2.5, the heat dissipated would go below zero. So in the end, we don't heat uh, the environment anymore with this. And um, because our memory, as you saw, is not completely symmetric, uh, we get this correction and uh, this is pushing the boundary down a bit, and each of these values is expected to be slightly lower. And the data points uh, you can see uh, compare quite nicely with what we expect. Here, here you still see the residuals with the gray bars that indicate that indicate um, how uncertain we are about our experimental parameters. So. Summarizing, we can say that with this uh, time-controlled unharmonic potential, we can pretty accurately reproduce what, what we would expect from the generalized Landauer bound, and we can show that the dissipated heat in, in such an operation can go below zero if we use the non-equilibrium state initially. And with this, uh, let me uh, go yet another step uh, back to harmonic potentials, actually, um, and tell you a bit about where we stand when it comes to quantum control. Um, this is our particle, um, again, in the optical tweezer. The, the cones, the green cones, are, of course, uh, drawn, but the the donut you see at the center is a real image of a particle in an optical tweezer. Um, and it's a donut because the polarization of the tweezer is pointing towards us. And uh, this is why no light is scattered directly towards us. Um, and uh, the initial idea of how we could get the motion of this particle now into the into uh, cold and in the best case into the ground state of motion was to use these uh, tools that I introduced initially of cavity optomechanics. Um, in 2010, there's been a few proposals 
actually um, similar ideas for um, for atoms and molecules have been put forward um, by Helmut Rich and uh, Vladimir Buditic, um even longer ago, and uh, and the idea is to to cool this particle motion. Now, today we know that that there's actually two good approaches. Um, one is with a cavity and one is without a cavity, essentially just the tweezer and feedback cooling. So for the tweezers, um, first experiments have been done like around 11 and 12. Jan's, uh, Jan Giselas was the first one with a levitated nanoparticle. And uh, by now, just this year, one can actually see a quantum signature of the particle motion in a sideband asymmetry. I, I will come to that in a moment. Also in our lab, um, uh, a tweezer has been implemented now where we can cool down essentially um, to the ground state to around a phonon. And, uh, and that is thanks to uh, the excellent detection that I said before and, and uh, a Kalman filter that, that has been used um, that we developed together with the Kugi group. So look out for that if you're interested. Um, but that's all I want to say about the, about the non-cavity systems. And let me come back to how it works in the cavity and where we stand. So without the cavity, um, if you look in the spectral domain, this is the, this is the driving laser, the particle moves, and because it moves with a harmonic frequency omega m, one sees a Stokes and anti-Stokes sideband here in red and uh, blue. Now, the, if we put a cavity around the particles, it would be modified, as I, I showed you initially, and uh, we can suppress the, the terms that would result in um, heating the particle and um, enhance the ones that result in cooling. And it is known in cavity optomechanics that if the mechanical motion is larger than the width of the cavity, then, <clears throat> then this will also enable cooling to the ground state given that this cooperativity is larger than one. Now, nanoparticles are a bit different, right? We, we don't have this clamped system. We don't, uh, uh, but, but we essentially have the particle already scattering a lot of light. And um, Uro Stelic in our group um, looked at this more closely while he was visiting Vladan Vulicic um, at MIT some time ago and, uh, and found that this is the better way of, of, of cooling nanoparticles because one gets rid of a few um, technical issues that we always have. So just very briefly, um, if we look at the system now, then we find that um, the energy of the system is given by the field um, like polarizability times intensity essentially, but this is given by the field of the tweezer and the field of the cavity. Therefore, there's an interference term uh, differently than when the thing is just, the cavity is just driven, um, <clears throat> which, uh, so we find a tweezer trap, we find uh, the usual optomechanical coupling, but we also find this interference term, which is coined due to some previous works on the topic, coherent scattering. Now, this interference term um, means that we can have the best cooling at a place where the, um, where, where the intensity in the cavity is minimal. And uh, this brings several advantages. Uh, phase noise doesn't play a role anymore, and we can uh, drive the particle much harder, essentially. In addition, one can also, um, oh, this is, sorry, the slide is slightly messed up. You can't see here uh, the references. But uh, just looking at the plot, what one can do um, is also to tune the polar polarization and, uh, and uh, look at cooling really of all three directions of the particle motion inside the cavity with this method. And um, uh, here they are. And finally, uh, this enabled us to actually cool into the ground state of motion. 
Now, how do we see that this happened? Well, um, in, usually we would have for for a pretty hot particle, we would have this uh, asymmetry in in the sidebands due to the cavity only. Now the particle comes closer to the ground state, and when it's down here, you cannot um, you cannot lose energy anymore when you are already in the ground state. So this introduces another asymmetry, which is essentially reducing the cooling term. So once one is getting close to the ground state, this peak here, which is the cooling term, will reduce. So here it's plotted when, when the occupation is two, here for an occupation of 0 0.5. Now, knowing very well how our cavity envelope looks like and, uh, and seeing this for different occupations, we can infer the temperature. Uh, calibrating just on the asymmetry between these two sides. And if we do that for different detunings of the, of the tweezer with respect to the cavity resonance, one can find here that the whole system is cooled into the um, ground state at 10 to the minus 6 millibar. And, uh, and here in green, you still see where the whole system could go at 10 to the minus 8 millibar, which is where the um, where the tweezer systems without cavity are right now. So now, now that we have that, what, what could we do? Well, the, the first and most obvious thing to think about, again, is, uh, is, is engines. No? Um, on the side of the thermodynamics, there's a please there of other uh, thoughts on in cavity optomechanics we're thinking about, but focusing on the thermodynamics, um, there's, a, there's Andreas, Eric, Dechant, Eric Lutz, and, and myself proposed a few years ago um, such a cavity optomechanical engine with a levitated nanoparticle. Um, we could now implement this not only for, for high temperatures and completely classical, but also pushing it down to where the granularity, so to say, of the energy plays a role. Now, if one does that, what one expects is that the efficiency of the engine would actually drop because, because uh, shot noise starts to play a role. So one has to take that into account. Um, at the same time, I showed you this multi-mode driving initially at the beginning of the talk that would allow it to prepare something like a squeeze target state. So this may be an option to show in, uh, in going away from, from uh, just coherent states or thermal states um, go to go to squeeze states that one can actually enhance the efficiency. And, um, and these are just a few of the first ideas where one could go, still using only harmonic potential, but now that we are having this ground state cooling. So putting it all together, um, I showed you a few experiments on the second law and the fluctuation theorem in under the thermodynamics. Um, we can, uh, as an instance of using our unharmonic potentials, we can show that one can reduce the heat flow in a bit erasure. And, um, and by now, uh, levitated nanos particles have entered into the quantum regime. Um, as we can now do ground state cooling and prepare reasonably pure states. <clears throat> and um, to wrap it up, I would say, uh, obviously, we, we now want to put all of that together, right? The, the unharmonic potential and, uh, and the cavity are, are still separate systems. On the experimental side, that's what happens ne next. But we are only at the beginning of, of, of seeing what we can do with this. So, of course, uh, we would like both in the classical and quantum regime to look at the thermodynamics in these complex and time dependent potentials and ask questions like how can we, how can we determine the relevant quantities, for example, uh, entropy production. Um, then something that I, that I, uh, always dream of since I, since I saw this beautiful ion engine um, quite a while ago, the single ion engine, you know, that also has the flywheel in, in uh, Ferdinand schmitz Carlos group. Um, with our optical potentials, we can 
build a geometry that that can do uh, something similar, I think, and then play with with all these kinds of driving, optimize the shape, um, and so on. I would like to understand much better how how that optimally looks like, and um, and then <clears throat> and then in a sense this unharmonicity um, brings us deep into the quantum regime uh, because we go away from uh, these uh, Gaussian states that we always have to deal with in a sense. Um, this is different than, than, than in many other cases because as soon as you have one away level, you would use qubits right, to, to, to do some state engineering. So the question is, how can we engineer truly quantum states? What can we do with them? And uh, from a thermodynamic perspective, maybe we can apply these methods to find fundamental boundaries on how uh, complex or how um, inco uh, how coherent can a, such a state in this open system be. Uh, and this is just a selection of three things that I find personally very interesting. There's uh, many more uh, that I find interesting and hopefully some that you find interesting um, and tell me if you like. <laughs> so thanks a lot for the attention. I would also like to thank all uh, people working with me, um, which you saw partially in the talk here. We are now working on XUV levitation with with uh, a new team. Also, all the all the levitation in the KVT and cooling is um, as many other things that I do. Uh, joint effort with uh, Markus Aspelmeier. Um, and the crew, and uh, of course, thanks to all my collaborators, is in particular to, to Eric Lutz and Mauro Paternostro, who initially actually introduced me into this whole field of stochastic and quantum thermodynamics. Thanks. Thanks very much, Nikolai. That was really, really nice. Um, so yeah, we've got time for questions, and we've already had um, a few questions from the audience. So. Um, let me just uh, turn on my camera so you can see me and then, um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, but I mean, uh, let me just reiterate that if anyone has any further questions, please do just write them in the YouTube chat window. Um, so, yeah, so the first question we had, well, we, we kind of had two closely related questions, so maybe I can ask them both together to avoid kind of repetition, but um, so um, Wen Chao Zhu asked, uh, I wonder how to quantify whether the particle has reached its thermal state. Um, and Archak Pokeyasta asked a kind of a similar question, which is, uh, how is the temperature of the oscillator estimated in the harmonic underdamped case? And is it even certain that it is in equilibrium? Since you showed an analogy with two different baths. Aha, uh -huh, yeah. So sort of how do you measure temperature and how do you even know that it's in a thermal state? That's kind of the, mm -hmm. those are the questions. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 very good question. So um, the, the, if I understand well, then, then this relates to well, we have this single particle and we don't have a thermometer to actually say what its temperature is. So um, what we do is we, we calibrate um, the whole system for the parameters we set on the experiment by having the particle equilibrate. Essentially, um, for a, set, a certain setting of the system, uh, the particle first plays our interferometer. So we know for each gain in the feedback, etc., we know what the temperature of uh, the bath is. And then when we uh, do the fast driving protocol, which puts the particle out of equilibrium, then, um, then we rely on this knowledge. So because then the particle actually doesn't have a temperature, right? It, it's not necessarily in a, in a thermal state then. Okay, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so then um, we have a question from um, Sebastian Defner, um, who says, Hi, Nikolai, great talk. Have you also thought about the information bearing degrees of freedom in your systems, since you already have looked into Landauer's bound, an information engine may not be so difficult to realize? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Very interesting point, yes. Um, we looked a little bit into... Um, into uh, this uh, Brownian information engine that has been proposed some time ago in, in the harmonic case. Um, but somehow for, for lack of, of time and manpower, we, we never really did it. Um, 
in general, um, we're, we're kind of coming back to that now because because this whole tweezer control that we are now implementing for the feedback, it already feels like it's kind of an information engine. And uh, and um, in the regime where we are working, we we expect we even expect to 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 be close to where quantum noise plays a role there. So, so I don't know if you have something specific in mind. It would be interesting to talk about, in particular in the non-linear uh, potential. But uh, yeah, so right now the feedback is the closest we have to an uh, information engine. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so um, well, we have plenty of time for more questions, guys. There's a little bit of a delay, so there may be some more that come in. Um, there's lots of people clapping and saying thanks for a very nice talk. Um, which of course you can't hear because it's just people putting emojis in a chat window. But anyway, um, <laughs> I will just... look at it later. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, but I can ask maybe a couple of questions because um, I'm curious about about some of the things. So, um, so I mean, I, I okay, maybe this question is not going to make much sense. I always find Landau erasure a little bit of a tricky thing to think about. But in, in the long in the non the non equilibrium Landau erasure example. I mean, mm -hmm. how much how much extra information does the eraser kind of have to know about the state in order for it to work? Do, do you see what I mean? I mean, is there some additional information that one has to to know? I mean, in order to get get some kind of gain from from this, not, the fact that it's out of equilibrium. Um, so, so uh, two parts on the answer. Um, so. During the whole protocol, this whole readout that we do for the evaluation is in principle unnecessary if we really just wanted to do the erasure. It's just there to know about the work. So, so we prepare the initial state and then, um, and then um, we could run it blindly and the state would be erased. Now, the but we do need to know something because the protocol to do it optimally depends on what the initial state precisely is. So in in our case, um, with this uh, compression, uh, with this expansion that we rapidly do, this kind of looks squeezed in phase space or squashed, um, and and uh, the whole protocol is done for this specific case. But then the idea would the the background idea is. Uh, is in a sense, this that that in a in a usual memory, but we still have to learn about lo a lot about uh, how actual memories work. But in a usual memory, you often would also not expect to have a uh, initial equilibrium state. And uh, and uh, and then if you know what what kind of state you have while you store the thing, as the whole thing con uh, memory consumes power and so on, if you know how that works, you might find a way how to exploit this. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's that's basically what I was what I was wondering about. That thanks, that makes a lot of sense. So you, you need it to be kind of reproducibly out of equilibrium and then you can actually reduce the dissipation of your of your exactly. computation by kind of harnessing that. Okay, that's yes. really interesting. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, and then I mean maybe I can just ask one one other quick question, um, and, and maybe if we have another question, then we can go to that. But um, so um, you mentioned this flywheel. Um, I, I think we yeah. actually maybe have talked about this before, but if you wouldn't mind just humouring me because I'm curious about this. Or I mean, how um, like because in the flywheel experiment you mentioned, there's there's a separation between the kind of the working medium and the air and the, the kind of harmonic oscillator, which is the, the energy storage device. But in mm -hmm. your optomechanics experiments, you typically, you just have the motion, right? So would you have like different modes playing this role or would you kind of use the yeah. oscillator to do both? Or how, how yeah. do you envisage this working? Yeah. So ex exactly. So so the, 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 the first way how I would envisage this is um, uh, using different degrees of freedom. In the, in the, in this in this experiment that uh, they did with ions in Ferdinand's group, uh, it's there's also two harmonic motions. Um, it's essentially a, a, a one one of them is is the the engine and the other one is the flywheel, and because this uh, wait I could do it like this. Well, it's just a second if I. I was expecting that I will have to use my hands. <laughs> so I just come back to not sharing 
Do you see me? No. So, so um, if we, if it, it's shaped like this, it's, I don't know what the English name for that would be. So you have the motion for the engine and you have the motion for the flywheel. And if you heat the system up, then it would essentially kind of expand out there. If you cool it down, it goes back, which is really pretty, right? Because you translate you to the harmonicity and harmonicity, this motion into that motion. Now, now optically, one could probably really do it such that there's different places for different temperatures and, um, and uh, also do different shapes. I don't know what would be optimal. And this is kind of rather running autonomously, only that we use a lot of laser power, of course. <laughs> right, yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. Um, and then, so we have another question from, from Archak uh, Pogayasta, who, who asks, uh, in the Landauer erasure, what happens when you just quench the potential suddenly, starting from the non-equilibrium state? Uh, I must say, I do not have much knowledge of Landauer erasure. Well, that's okay, Archak, I think it's a good question. So yeah, what happens if you just quench the, the potential suddenly? What what if we quench the potential suddenly in the usual in the normal Landauer, or um, or in our case? Well, I, I guess he's asking about the non-equilibrium case, but may, I mean, yeah. I guess yeah. either one would be either one or both would be an interesting yeah. part of the answer. Yes. So um, so in our case, this is actually the the modification one needs to do on the on the potential uh, on the protocol. So the, the modification is that we essentially switch qu quench quickly back to what the state what was equilibrating to and then and then slowly opening it. Um, for the uh, equilibrium case, I don't know, so I, I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> just <answered it. laughs> okay, fair enough. But but the I, equilibrium I, I, case, I assume that you just create some entropy production because you're doing this. Yeah. Indeed, yeah. I mean, the usual intuition is you have to do Landauer very slowly, right? Another in order to to minimize the dissipation. So yeah, yeah. I think that makes that's that's great. Um, okay, so I think we um, yeah, John Gould just just chipped in and said it costs you more heat. So uh, we 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 all agreed with that. So um, I think um, that's probably all the questions. So um, let's let's kind of conclude um, there. So. Um, Thanks to everyone for tuning in, of course, um, as always, and particularly thanks very much, Nikolai Kiesel, for giving us such a nice, uh, clear talk. Thanks. It was really great, even though I don't see all of you. I will now look at the claps now. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay.